What is up, what is up, what is up, everyone? I am Charlie Shrem, and you are listening and watching to Untold Stories, where twice a week we get to dive deep with some of crypto's most influential leaders to find out how this movement truly came to be and figure out where the hell we're going. We're now in the midst of some crazy bull market uh, trajectories. We're in some crazy finagling. No one really knows what's going on. But one of the people that can potentially give us some insight into the into the retail world and, and what's happening on the ground is my friend Brandon Mitz, the founder and CEO of Bitcoin Depot. You guys manage over, you guys run and operate over over a thousand uh, crypto ATM. Uh, I'd like to call them banking kiosks around the United States. Um, and it really is like a, such a, a guerrilla marketing, you know, like down, uh, uh, on the ground, on the front lines type of industry, because you are literally putting these machines in physical locations. These are physical people. It's not a, it's not an online, it's an online service, but it really is like, like the, you know, the infantry in, in the army of cryptocurrency. So thank you for being that and, and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Charlie. Good to talk with you. You are uh, just telling me that you finished Rick reading Bitcoin Billionaires uh, last week. What do you think of it? Yeah, so I uh, just finished it. Um, didn't realize how much of a partier you were back then. <laughs> when I was a kid, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, th so that was interesting. But uh, it was just good to learn more about the story of the early days. And when I first started buying Bitcoin, that was towards the end of Bit Instant. And, you know, I was going through a lot of the struggles that, you know, everybody else is going through trying to buy Bitcoin back then. So I completely understand, you know, your mission and the business model that you were trying to achieve. I think it was super helpful. You you started um you started the the company before Bitcoin ATMs and you started cash to crypto. And this was a way for people to get crypto or Bitcoin really quicker. Why, why do that? Why start it? So in fall of 2013, I found out about Bitcoin uh, through a friend of a friend when I was at the University of Georgia. And I was just super intrigued uh, learning about it. And after a couple of weeks, I decided to go buy it. I actually placed an order on Coinbase. So it took me about two weeks just to get my account set up and, and get approved. Um, they just weren't really responsive and getting back to me. I place an order and I'm supposed to get my Bitcoin about a week later. I place an order at about $400 of Bitcoin. A week later, Bitcoin's at 900 and then my order gets canceled. Yeah. So I missed out on more than doubling my money and I'm just super frustrated. So I, I come back to... Uh, the guy told me about Bitcoin. I said, hey, there's got to be another solution. So I discovered this website called Cash in the Coins. And it, it basically said, hey, you know, deposit money into this Wells Fargo bank account and we'll send you Bitcoin in 15 minutes. So I thought, oh, this is kind of weird. This is just some guy's bank account. This website looks kind of sketchy. It's just yeah. like text. There's no design even on this website. But I was so eager to buy Bitcoin, I was going to risk just losing the money and just go try it. So I deposited $1,000 and sent a photo of my receipt. 15 minutes later, the Bitcoin was sent to me. And my mind was blown because I had just spent three weeks trying to buy it on Coinbase. I spent countless hours, probably over 100 hours, just researching and figuring out how to buy it. And all I did was deposit cash. And a few minutes later, I got Bitcoin. Super easy. I and banked at Wells Fargo. So it was already there anyways. And so I realized that, you know, um, I'm a pretty smart guy, I'd say. And other people are probably going through the same issue. Um, and I need to make this solution available to others. Because it was really hard to discover this website. And I didn't see any any other similar services being offered. And by the time I got in, it was already done. And so I wanted to uh, start this business and resell crypto to other people and make it easier for everybody else. And I'll do all the hard work on the back end, trying to figure out how to buy from the exchanges all around the world and resell to people here in the US. 
what type of of neighborhoods do you see do you see um like a huge demand not specifics of course but uh how do you go about looking for where to put one of these machines well the demographics are all over the place right now you know we do well in wealthy areas middle class areas uh low income areas but what i can tell you is the underbanked and unbanked part of the population is starting to realize that there's a new way of doing things and you don't have to use check cashing stores, Western Union and prepaid cards anymore. You can just start using Bitcoin uh, to complete all of those services. So the majority of the demographic is is more in, in that lower middle income range. Uh, a lot of the people who are underbanked and unbanked prefer to use cash. So we try to focus on those areas, but at the same time, our goal is to provide access to crypto and make it as simple and easy as possible. And people of all walks of life need that. So we go everywhere. There's a, a huge amount of people. Let's just talk about the U.S. right now. Huge amount of people un, unbanked or, or underbanked. And we can kind of go into the definition of that. It's not an easy thing to get a bank account especially if you've been disenfranchised uh, like myself, or if you've been uh, dealing with any type of mental or physical type of uh, issues in your life, or, um, or if you've made mistakes or gone down the wrong path, or if you're just someone uh, who doesn't come from, from a, a, a middle-class world where you know banking and, and how to write a check and, and all that stuff was part of what you learned growing up. Most people don't know how to even write a check and things like that. The whole financial world is still a huge mystery to almost everyone, myself included. And it's it's on purpose. It's a mystery on purpose. The more mysterious it is, how you know, when you walk into a bank, what is actually going on? Most people don't understand how, even how banks make money. Most people don't realize that banks will make 18% on every dollar we deposit, but we're only getting a percent, maybe, because it's tied to the Federal Reserve rate. But banks are still making money. You have all these issues. And and when Bitcoin first came out and crypto first came out, everyone was focusing on building out all these features and services and the entrance into crypto, into Bitcoin, but it was all done through the banking world. You got to connect your bank account. You, it assumes that you're already in the financial sector, but most people aren't. And the people that need crypto are the ones who are not in that sector. So now these people have a physical manifestation of the crypto world at a physical location that they're used to going to already. Right. So that's the goal. And uh, we actually trademark the phrase digital becomes physical. It, it's really about just making this less scary. You know, you're, you want to be able to go out to somewhere you're familiar with, um, go to a machine that looks like a cash ATM that you probably use the cash ATM in your life as well. And most of us have used them in convenience stores, which is where our machines are primarily placed and being able to get in and out within a couple of minutes and being able to call someone on the phone. You know, a lot of other options uh, don't even supply phone support or long wait times. Uh, Bitcoin Depot users can call and will answer in about 15 seconds. So we make it uh, less mysterious and complex and we we truly just dumb it down to what bitcoin is meant to be at its core and for most people that's all they need to know that's all they care to know they don't have to know all the intricacies of the technologies and how exactly a transaction is put together and processed we just need to know about the actual use cases that's what's important a lot of these a lot of these users come on and they create accounts with you uh do you see a lot of repeat customers? Do you see a lot of uh, customers? Like I know some industries like um, I have vacation rentals and for some reason with certain types of vacation rentals, you don't get a lot of repeat uh, people. You don't have a lot of repeat uh, uh, residents or kind of residents, guests or whatever. Uh, I know some industries don't. Is this something where you have a lot of people that are coming back time and time again or do they graduate to like the eventually using Robinhood or Square or Coinbase or something like that? Is this their first foray or is it their always foray? That's a good question. So we have looked at our data and over half of our users of our Bitcoin ATMs actually come back and oh, wow. use us again. 
That's amazing. The uh, is there a way like to to have a community of these people and to see uh, who they are and why they're they're using machines and what what they think of 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 the whole industry? Because I feel like I still feel like those who are using uh, machines, it's a completely untapped market. Uh, things like being able to put uh, ads on the screens of the machines or doing surveys, right? Like you're talking about, I don't know how many people you have, but you probably have thousands of people a day coming to use these machines. You're talking about those eyeballs. I wonder if you can do like crypto related surveys and uh, polling in real time that, that other people, the data you must have must be amazing. Yeah, I mean, we totally can. Uh, we have that access at our fingertips to ask them all types of questions. And we have surveyed them to a certain extent so far. And that's that's one of our goals in the future to just understand our, our users more and more and what their needs are and how we can improve our product to be able to facilitate helping them with whatever their needs are. Well, because you you were that like person on the ground, right? When you had, how did you convince the first like five locations to even put these machines inside? What were you telling to the store owners? Well, back then, twenty sixteen, when I really started, uh, they they would just get so caught up on Bitcoin. They never heard of it, didn't know what it is. They wanted to understand it. I was focused at first more on smoke shops like vape and tobacco shops and liquor stores and they just couldn't wrap their head around it. So it was pretty difficult. I remember the the first location I I ever signed, I think I had to go there five times to convince the owner to let me put this yeah. machine there. And then I started shifting my pitch a little bit. I thought you know, these business owners, do they really care that that much what the, the product is until they find a use case for it for themselves and understand and why it's going to change time. the global economy? Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't have time to teach them that within just a few minute pitch over the phone. Could you so imagine? I started shifting the conversation to, hey, look, you know, I just want to put this box here. You know, it accepts cash. And I want to rent space in your store. Here's what I'm going to pay you. Does this work? And I started getting a way higher success rate versus just trying to go into what Bitcoin is and explain mm. it to them. Because for a lot of people, it just doesn't click in the first or second conversation. You know, it takes multiple conversations. It can take weeks and a lot of research on their own time. So it was really hard in the beginning. And after the first few ma machines, though, I just hit this stride. And I ended up signing up about 45 stores within four months and became the second largest Bitcoin ATM company that existed. While other people, uh, it, it took a couple of years because I just, I just found what worked. People still don't, uh, you know, I have to, I have to like agree with you because early on I was doing a lot of this evangelizing and felt like I needed to uh, be that person to, to teach everyone about Bitcoin. And I did that. And it's exhausting. Thousands of people. Roger Veer still does it today. Uh, every single person. We'd be going, you know, years ago, we'd, Roger and I would go and have Korean barbecue somewhere. And the first thing he'd do is go over to the store owner and start talking about Bitcoin. I'm like, Roger, we're hungry. We just want to eat, you know? But I have to say what worked better is when people kind of get teased on their own and then they figure it out on their own and then they come back to questions because it's like, I met an aircraft engineer one time and he, he was like to me, Charlie, it must be so funny explaining to people what Bitcoin is. And I'm like, what do you mean? He said, well, okay, imagine if you're the Wright brothers, right? Imagine if, 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 if people never have seen aircraft fly and they don't even understand why it's important to the world that will have flying aircraft, right? And imagine someone walks up to you randomly and says, explain aircraft to me, explain how they work, why they're important. You're not going to sit and be able to explain the mechanics specifically of how an airplane, you know, things like that. So that's kind of, uh, it's, I don't know if that's like the best analogy, but it's one of the analogies that he explained to me. And I said, you know, it really makes sense because uh, 
when, if, if someone were to come to you and said, Hey, I'm really interested in aircraft and like, I get this, this aspect of it, but I don't get this, this aspect of it. It's a lot easier to explain to someone how it all works. When people come to me and they say, Oh, Charlie, like I'm a, I work, I, I grow bananas and I love blockchain. I'm like shit, I have to explain to this guy why blockchain is important from the use case of bananas, right. but I could do that through supply chain. You know, you're what, so that's what you're talking about, that shift. And like these people eventually, all these store owners, do they, do they ever, do some of them ever call you after the fact and say, oh yeah, Brandon, like this Bitcoin thing is actually pretty damn cool. Can I ask you questions on it? You'd be surprised. Barely any of them. Uh, and your analogy is, is correct. I mean, people, they don't want to learn about something until they find a use case in their life. Like, Right now, if people ask me, well, I don't know how Bitcoin works. I don't want to buy it. And I'm telling them, look, just put in $20. Not that big of a deal. I say, do you know how the internet works? And, and everybody goes, no. Well, you use yeah. it every single day. <laughs> and you have what no did... idea. It, it really doesn't matter. So the key is, is you know, getting them to understand a use case. Uh, for example, if you know anybody with an e-commerce business, they likely have people charging back their credit and debit purchases because of all the time. And so you tell that, that e-commerce merchant, well, Hey, if you accept Bitcoin, there's no chargebacks and there's no middleman. So you're, you're going to pay a very small fee to accept payment from your customers. Or you go tell someone who immigrated from South America, Hey, you don't have to go to Western union and stand in line, physically fill out a form. You know, you can just buy Bitcoin and you can just transfer it over to them uh, within a few minutes to their wallet. So getting people to understand a use case that applies to their life and then educating seems to work best for me. And that's usually some of the hardest, like the hardest thing to do. But you're right. That is the best, best way to educate people on Bitcoin and on crypto. What did you do before? What did you do before you got into this industry? Hey everyone, I'm Charlie Shrem, and it's time to get out of the Stone Age and into the crypto future at Big Casino. Over the next four weeks, famous statues are ready to take you on this epic journey around the world to share their love of Big Casino. So follow along as a new statue is revealed each week with a cool video. All you have to do is guess that statue that comes next and win big with a two Bitcoin raffle and over three Bitcoin and weekly prizes with three different ways to win. That's over five Bitcoin up for grabs. Yep, you heard that correctly. BitCasino has given away over five Bitcoin with two Bitcoin in raffles, plus like three Bitcoin and weekly prizes. Come on, they're giving away Bitcoin and we all know the supply of Bitcoin is very hard to come by. There's a finite supply. So these guys are giving them away. All you have to do is go on BitCasino and guess the new statue. So get out of the stone age and get into the crypto future. Head to BitCasino to win big. It's a crazy world when I tell you that everything we say, do, hear, see, sleep, everything that we uh, interact with the world is being constantly listened to, packaged up and sold to other people without our permission. But we already know that. Don't you? You're, you're not in your head. We know that. Why are we OK with it? We shouldn't be. We're not getting paid for any of that. Well, my sponsor, Permission.io, actually a very cool company. And you could check them out at Permission.io forward slash Charlie. They figured out a way for you to get a piece of the action because advertisers are going to be targeting you no matter what. And now you can decide which advertisers are able to do so by granting them specific permission and then you get a piece of the action. So you're like basically earning rewards for doing what you already do online, consuming the content and sharing all your favorite information. Now, right at this minute, only these tech giants are profiting from your data. You have all these like uh, Cambridge Analytica and all these like uh, crazy files that are coming out with how our data is being used against us to spin elections and fake news and blah, blah, blah. With my sponsor, Permission.io, that is about to change. If anything, check it out. It's so cool what they're doing and how they're doing it. You can get a special sneak peek at Permission.io forward slash Charlie. And thank you guys. Thank you, Permission team, so much for sponsoring and allowing me to do what I love to do and to do this show. So for many of the countries that Bittrex Global 
serves. There's no easy way for investors to purchase stocks like Apple, Tesla. In fact, just the other day, I personally wanted to get involved in the Airbnb IPO, but I couldn't. There's no way to get tokenized stocks. Or is there? This will be the first and only way that Bittrex Global customers can access the U.S. stock market and legally own U.S. stocks from anywhere in the world. Tokenized stocks. It is so cool. So these shares are tokenized and it's possible to buy like a fractionized portion of a stock. So for example, like Berkshire Hathaway, I think trades at $300,000 a share. Now through Bittrex Global, you can actually just buy $300 worth or $500 worth. And then these tokenized stocks are legally bound to the stock itself and it trades exactly like the stock does. It's beautiful. It's actually what blockchain is supposed to do. It's why we're here in the first place. It's This is bringing about the next level of these like credit and capital markets and it's allowing global people uh, all over the world to, to, to participate in some of the coolest companies that are based in America today or even companies around the world. Like I could see so many different applications of this one utility. Um, stocks on the U.S. stock market only trade between like 9.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. The, just the other day I had to Google that because I don't even know that. But because these assets are tokenized, they're going to trade 24 hours a day. And n not only that, like individual stocks, but investors can also invest in the whole like S&P 500. Uh, they can get into the, uh, all these indexes uh, just through Bittrex Global's tokenized stock. It's so cool make sure you check out global.bitrex.com forward slash discover forward slash tokenized dash stocks we're gonna have it in our show notes this is one of the front running new on the front lines application of blockchain technology and you guys are gonna have so much fun with it well when i got it and i was 19 <laughs> so i oh. didn't do a whole Anything. lot um i i had worked in uh restaurants primarily throughout high school, you know, you're getting paid an hourly rate. And then I, I became a server and then I realized you could get tips. And so, you know, the better service you get, the more, the more money you can make, but kind of the such an interesting life moment, lesson, right? What's that? Such an interesting life lesson to learn at a young age is that the better, the better service you give to people, the more money they'll give you back. Yes, very true. So, I mean, that's restaurants. It's a very, very difficult industry, exhausted, high stress, working in the late hours of night, still having to go to school. But I actually grew up uh, near a lake here in Georgia. And my first uh, major entrepreneur light bulb that went off in my head was when I realized people knew nothing about boats and jet skis. And when something breaks, you know, people just think it's it's worthless and they give it away for nothing. So I started a little business towards the end of high school, uh, buying and selling boats and jet skis because I would read 300 page engine manuals, figure out all the problems that could exist. And I would know how much it would cost to fix each problem. And I would show up to somebody who didn't have any idea what was going on. And they just thought what they had was worthless. And I just knew. Okay, you know, I was creating a P and L in my head. Okay, here's the purchase That's so price. Cool. Here's the expenses. Um, here's the resale value minus tax. You know, what am I going to net? And I ended up making about four thousand dollars my first week at eighteen years old doing that. And it would have taken me three, four months to make four thousand dollars working part time at a restaurant. So I was like, whoa, I gotta just stop everything else and start this business and did that for about a year and a half until I found out about Bitcoin and I had some, some money to throw into Bitcoin and, in, in late 2013. And I put, you know, I went crazy actually. I probably put 95% of the cash that I had in Bitcoin oh, about two weeks after finding out about it, <laughs> which at the time might've been $15,000. Yeah. And I just let it all ride. You know, it was yeah. crazy. It, it was doubling in a week. And then the next week it would go down to it half of what I had. It it was it was very wild. Um, but I I'm, I'm glad I did it. And what I found out from that is I am not good at trading. 
you do not want me to try and play the market. I'm the same way, yeah. And, and buy and buy and sell. Let me just operate the machines, and I charge a markup, and and that's it. So you got the entrepreneurial sense, and you figured out how to start a business with a few machines. But then you go from five machines to fifty, and fifty to five hundred. I learned very early on that I I don't know how to scale a business from. 10 people to 50 people. My perfect business size is five or six people. More than that, uh, I've never done it before. Did you not, never run into self-doubt on building a business and growing it to dozens of people and managerial layers and hundreds, if not eventually thousands of machines? Are you, are you flying by the seat of your pants? Do you have any mentors that kind of are showing you the way? That's a good question. So I started the first business, Cash to Crypto, and Late 2013. I did not hire my first full time employee until January of 2017. I had oh, a couple wow. of people as contractors part time here and there. It was very scary to give away control when you're dealing with irreversible money and it's all of your money. It's 100% my money. And you're working with other kids that are 20 years old and have no idea how life works or business works that are in that the hands of, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of your funds mm -hmm. and the one wrong click of a button and it could all be gone. One wrong click. It's true. One wrong click. So I was just terrified to, to give away that control. And so I, I realized I had to, I mean, I was working 80, 90 hours a week going to school, um, barely sleeping, sick all the time. I mean, I had to do something to be able to grow and scale. So after I graduated, um, I hired my first employee who was a longtime friend of mine since high school. We were roommates in college. I knew I could trust him. And if he did make that one wrong click, it would be purely by accident. Oh. <laughs> It happens to the best uh, so of us. I, I hired him and then I built uh, a small team around him over the next year. Compliance officer, accountant, uh, customer support. And then I had a, another bottleneck where I couldn't figure out how to go beyond one person in each team. Because then I had to have full trust in that one person that the other five or 10 people that they manage, they would manage them as well or nearly as well as I did. And it really took me a, another year or two after that um, to understand how to scale the team. And, and the key is, is just to get my, my knowledge and expertise, I have to dump it into somebody else's brain and I have to understand you know, how they work best and where to put them. And they just have to shadow me until I feel comfortable to let them go be autonomous. That's a very and good way of, me, of running a business that way. It took me until really mid 2019 to get to that point. So almost six years after I started my first business. And once I found the first few good managers, it, it went quick. Uh, and I'm still learning. You know, at the beginning of this year in 2020, Pre-COVID, I had about 25 full-time people. And today, we have about 70. And about 15 more part-time and contractors. Wow. So I finally understand you know, what you have to do to, to, scale the to scale the business and scale the team. And it really involves finding the right people from the beginning. Can you give some more advice to those listeners who have those three to four person businesses now and they're looking to scale it? bigger because a lot of my listeners are starting out their budding uh, crypto businesses and they've have there and their friends and they have an app idea or a different service or infrastructure. We're talking about the next unicorns in our space are listening to this show right now. What type of advice would you give them? Say like going from five to 15 people, or I don't know if that's the best metric or, you know, if their machine, if their business looks at it, it is a, uh, like a 10 X type of growth, like how do you get there? You have to figure out how to find the, the great fits for those first five people on the team. 
I had to go through a person or two in each position until I found the right one that could truly scale uh, each department of the company. And you have to have somebody that you're not going to worry about. If you find yourself worrying about every decision that they're making, and it's not going to work. You know, you try and work through it with them for months, and you're still worried, and they're still making too many mistakes. You're never going to be able to just let go and let them grow their area of the company. And as a CEO of a company, the only way you can grow is continuously delegate responsibilities and keep moving up. Just keep shedding responsibilities, keep moving to higher and higher level things. And you have to find the people that you don't have to worry about, that you can trust, that you're confident in, can do the job without you being there. You know, I need people that, that if I was off the grid for a month, and I come back, the company's still running just as good as when I left. It might not be growing as fast, but we're still in the same place. Those are the type of people that, that you want. And the first time you, you hire somebody in each position, they may not be the right fit and you may have to go through one or two more people until you find the right person. And you let them shadow you, these new hires or whatever. And then that's how you kind of figure out if this is the right person for the job. Yeah. I mean, you're going to be talking That's smart. throughout the day. If you're virtual, I mean, if you want to find the right fit for a small company and you hire someone to be a manager, you guys are going to be calling each other at least 10 times a day. It needs to be like <laughs> video. Going to be things yeah. coming up. On Zoom, um, I remember uh, when I... Uh, this was pre-COVID, but uh, I had a job and it was... Uh, I had a job. I was the chief operating officer for Jack's Wallet for a year. and. I didn't want to move to Canada. So I sat on Zoom from nine to five every single day, like never logged off and just had to manage the team in Canada from my you know, office in Florida, but doing it virtual nonstop, like nine to five, never like exiting the camera. Uh, and then I got a double robot and I would just drive my robot around and I was like firing people with this damn robot. And that was too far. I was like, I'm done with this. I can't do this anymore. Yeah, I mean, that's really what you have to do is the more communication, the better, because you need to truly understand how they work in every type of situation. I want to talk big picture again uh, to bring this all together. There are, I don't know, millions of, of ATM automatic teller machines around the world. In the United States, they're very low quality machines. They don't really do much. In Europe, I've seen they could do a little bit more. They could do some cool things. They're actually the, they're they're banking kiosks. They've got rid they've gotten rid of in a lot of places. You know, branches altogether. You're still seeing though an explosive growth of the crypto ATM market because your machines now you have a lot more control of them and you can do a lot more than the traditional machines that are out there already. Do you see Bitcoin ATMs or crypto ATMs eventually? Uh, being at mass scale around the world, do you see these machines as being the the psychological way people know that they could always get in and out of, of cryptocurrency if they ever need to? Yeah, I mean, there definitely is not as much of a need for for bank branches these days. And yeah, right. You know, these Bitcoin ATMs, they're they're really kiosks with Bitcoin software on them. Traditional cash ATMs here in the in the U.S. There, the software is is very old school. It serves one one purpose: dispense cash. Uh, where these kiosks are more programmable in different ways. I've seen people that that have the same hardware as us uh, create sports betting kiosks, yeah. check cashing kiosks, um, all sorts of things, but. You know, there's there's more and more infrastructure being built now to where you could actually live off of crypto entirely. You know, you cash in and out through a Bitcoin ATM uh, or other means. You get one of the the Bitcoin debit cards. Yeah, you can live uh, off you're of good it. It's crazy. At that point. It's it's a. Uh... It's such a cool thing to use a machine. And I really want to implore everyone, if you've not used a crypto ATM machine, it's fun. It's actually a very exciting process because 
you're, we, you know, humans, we want things in real time. We want to feel, touch, smell, see, and we want to, 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 to not have to trust. When you go to one of these machines, it all kind of happens in real time. And a lot of them are very nice looking and, and the software is very intuitive. Um, and so how can, how can my listeners find one of your machines? And what is the process like of like signing up? Should they come on your website, create an, uh, an account first, and then go to get a, to a machine? Can they do everything uh, at one? Do you call them machines? What are you, what's your lingo? So we call them... Bitcoin ATMs, but within Bitcoin specifically, we call Bitcoin Depot specifically, we call them BTMs. That's just our name that mm. we're trademarking. Um, I like that. So you know that BTMs are, are Bitcoin Depot, but the the best way to find one is to go to bitcoindepot.com. So you know you can just look on a map near you, search your address, call one of our customer support reps to help guide you to a current location. They're primarily in 24-7 convenience stores. So any time of day or night, run down to your local um, gas station in your neighborhood. You can buy buy crypto. Uh, we have some in malls now. If you're out oh, shopping cool. for the holidays, uh, we have a lot of the big name mall companies we work with in the country. So there's over 1,200 train, of them. How do you train your customer service people? These They have to be more well-versed in crypto than like me because they're answering these calls and explaining things to people. Well, I think the training is not as rigorous as you think because the users are not going to be super sophisticated for Bitcoin ATMs. The super sophisticated people are probably using online exchanges and know how to trade yeah. and swap, you know, Bitcoin for other cryptos. Uh, but for our users, they're asking more of the basic questions of, okay, where do I get a wallet? Got um, it. You know, how do I find a machine? Um, when is the crypto sent to me after the purchase is made? Stuff like that. Uh, it's the, it. the biggest issue I would find is that they, they don't understand the mempool and how sometimes transactions are backed up. And so if we send out the, the Bitcoin to them right after the purchase, and the mempool is really backed up. Maybe it takes an hour and they're like, oh, where's my Bitcoin? Did I get scammed? You know, yeah. what happened? That's a user interface issue, not on your part, but of the whole industry on how we treated the mempool and how we, the messaging around that. And that'll change. That'll get better. Yeah. I mean, there just needs to be more awareness of... Hmm you know, why sometimes transactions are, are backed up in a, in a simple way, you know, more usage, higher fees, yeah, only limited capacity of the network. But it's balancing itself out. Uh, it has been balancing, it's balancing itself out, especially in this, in this, in this market. And you guys are probably going crazy and, and you have people that are coming like the first time to you. So, um, thank you for what you're doing and continuing to to grow the business and thank you for taking the time and, and coming on untold stories and teaching people about this whole part of our industry that no one really knew existed. How many uh, BTMs, not just Bitcoin Depot, but how many are in the United States today? How many are in the world? In the U S today, I believe it's around 9,000. Uh, the U S wow. has about 75 to 80% of the market at any time, which has been holding steady for, for the past, uh, few years, actually. Uh, so worldwide, there's only maybe two to three thousand more. The awesome. other markets are are really not nearly as developed as the U.S. Yeah, they take some time. It's like every country will have like it's more for novelty. Sometimes I'll see it like a, uh, um, but it's it's growing as people know it's there. Well, thank you, Brandon. I appreciate you taking the time today. Yeah, thanks so much, Charlie, and uh, to everybody listening. I just wanted to give you guys. A heads up, uh, we're still growing. We're still hiring. A lot of you might have lost jobs because of COVID. We have about 20 open positions right now, and most of them are completely remote. We love people who are already, you know, experts in, in crypto and understand the industry. So if you guys apply and you're uh, a crypto veteran, then you definitely have a, a leg up. And if you're already listening to this podcast, you're probably in that description. So the careers page is on our website. Check
check us out, apply for one of the many jobs we got listed, and we'll look out for your resumes. And thanks so much, Charlie, for having me. Enjoyed the conversation and um, hope to be on again in the future. I hope to see you again soon. And I hope my listeners are the ones that apply uh, for those jobs. It, it, if you do, like, make sure you guys say, like, heard it on Untold Stories or whatever. Awesome. Thank you, Brandon. I'll talk to you later. Definitely.